Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistanomy. My name is Uzair Yunus and joining us once more is Shuja Nawaz, a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council. Needs no introduction. Um and if you haven't read his book The Battle for Pakistan, it's a must read. Check it out in terms of understanding. Uh there's lots of conversation these days about the current political crisis in Pakistan and what's going on in Afghanistan and all of that. And that book perhaps is the most authoritative historical text. about all that played out and much more um and then if you want to go further back in time shuja nawaz wrote a book crosswords which again for any student of pakistan's political history its economic history um again those two books combined i would argue and i tell this to a lot of folks who ask what books should we read and like if you read those two books you perhaps will get 80 to 90% of all that has happened in recent memory so shuja saab welcome to pakistanomy once more and thank you so much for taking out the time Thank you, Azhar. Always good to speak with you. We're recording this episode, Shuja Nawaz, on December sixteenth. Um, it's an important day for various reasons. Um, perhaps the more historical reasons kind of have been forgotten, particularly this year, in terms of all that has been happening in Pakistan and the drama. So maybe why don't you tell us about why this is an important day to remember? and what are some of the things that you think about um in terms of you know i i know before you told me that you have a uh perpetual reminder uh for this they set on your calendar so help us understand why have you done that and why is it that younger pakistanis right median age of 24 not born majority not born when the country became a nuclear state why should they remember and think about this day well um this is a very emotional day for many of us particularly uh, those of us that lived through that period uh, that were in the country uh, and i was then a young journalist working for pakistan television uh, and i i i witnessed the 1970 elections which were filled with great hope for pakistan and then i witnessed the breakup of pakistan and for us uh, december 16th will be forever etched in, in our memories which is why i have a reminder on my calendar that comes up every year on the 3rd of december when the full scale war was declared uh, and then uh, this day of course uh, when the instrument of surrender was signed by general niazi and, and general arora in dhaka and um, the word bangladesh was officially recognized in that document um, by pakistan and signed by general niazi on behalf of the pakistan army uh, and uh, we we had for the first time uh, the surrender of pakistani troops uh, in, in such large numbers to the indian army it was not a surrender to the bangladeshis or to the mukti bahini it was a surrender to the indian army so it remains forever etched in our memory um, and i was thinking um, if uh, t s eliot were to write uh, a new version if he were to come back to earth and write a new version of the wasteland uh, his opening lines for pakistan may well be uh, december is the cruelest month uh, because we shouldn't forget that today is also the anniversary of the attack on the army public school in peshawar by the ttp which was the internal battle uh, inside pakistan um launched by the ttp against the state uh, and which also reflected uh, in many ways the failure of security uh, of providing safety and security uh, to our people and particularly to to the military families where 150 lives were lost um a very large number of them from 134 young students that were that were uh, brutally murdered Uh, and then going back further uh, for december's calendar is filled with bloody reminders there was in 2009 um i remember vividly and, and you might recall hearing about it too the attack on the military mosque in westridge which is uh, uh, a small part of of rawalpindi cantonment uh, and where the triple one brigade is headquartered also Uh, and the mosque was attacked and people were targeted and brutally killed uh, including uh, the son of a, a friend of mine who was then a, a commander of uh, of troops in the 
then Northwest Frontier Province. So um, these are sad and uh, horrible reminders, uh, but we have to deal with them. Uh, and our role, um, and particularly mine as a as a amateur historian, is to try and make sure that people go back and look at the history and see what actually happened uh, and not the kind of wishful thinking that is often expressed by some of our leaders. You mentioned the APS attack. And again, I vividly remember that day I was in Karachi at that point and there was, you know, a vigil uh, at Dotalwar and a throng of people came out. You didn't expect something like that to happen, but there was an outpouring. Uh, the campaign uh, very quickly then began and you saw uh, a sort of unity, at least uh, short-lived unity among political leaders, military leaders, etc. And then to add to your point about December, uh, Benazir Bhutto was martyred towards the end of this month in 2007 as well. And again, that moment uh, is etched in many of our memories. For those of us who are younger, I remember Karachi was up in flames um, at that day, on that night. Um, and, you know, nobody knew what was going to happen thereafter. Um, and of course, the years were filled with chaos following her assassination. Um, Going back to 1971 and the birth of Bangladesh, um, you know, you've spoken about this on television shows a bit as well. We saw the outgoing army chief uh, in a weird way, I would say, uh, blame politics for the birth of Bangladesh and sort of saying that this was a political failure, not a military failure. Um, how do you see the events in the run up to those uh, to the birth of Bangladesh, so to speak? What went wrong? Where did it begin to go wrong and where ultimately uh, must the blame lie if ultimately we have to, you know, talk about that blame and and what can a, a society like Pakistan, what should it have learned um, from that experience? I think there's enough blame to go around. Um, and it's not simply a question of saying uh, political or, or military defeat. Uh, the real question is, it was the defeat of the idea of Pakistan. The idea of Pakistan that Mr. Jinnah had given us in 1947. Uh, but I uh, I did an essay on this for Dawn uh, this year on uh, the 14th of August on the 75th anniversary of independence of Pakistan. And the title that the editors put on that was What Went Wrong in 1971. And I was trying to examine what went wrong. And uh, my answer varies from that of uh, General Bajwa, because uh, I'm not assigning blame. I'm simply trying to understand uh, what was it that contributed to the breakup of Pakistan uh, that led to the Indian invasion and that led to the surrender on, on this day in Dhaka. Um, and, and in that sense, it was a, a national failure, but it had its roots in uh, politics and in the way we manage our society. And the fact that uh, we we had the Western wing of Pakistan essentially dominating decision making uh, and using the Eastern wing as a sort of a colony. And over time, this uh, feeling grew among the people of East Pakistan, uh, culminating in a series of events uh, that happened from 1970 onwards um, that accelerated their desire to have greater autonomy first, and then independence. So um, very briefly, uh, after the elections, when uh, the majority in parliament uh, went to Sheikh Mujib's Awami League, and he won almost all the seats in uh, in East Pakistan, uh, he, he uh, had allies in the West, but he didn't have any seats in the West. And in the West, uh, Mr. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's Pakistan's People Party, People's Party had the majority, uh, but uh, they didn't have a, a national presence uh, at that time, and he had no seat in East Pakistan, uh, and so um, his was clearly the minority in the national in the National Assembly, if the Assembly had been called, and uh, General Yaya essentially lost control. Uh, he lost control after having actually held a very free and fair elections that produced the results that uh, they they did. Uh, and then uh, he was manipulated by people around him, uh, including by uh, Mr. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, 
who didn't want to lose this opportunity of becoming the leader of Pakistan. Um, and and then other things happened. Uh, briefly, we had um, floods uh, in, in uh, 1970 uh, preceding the elections. The elections were postponed to December. And, and then uh, the question was, uh, you know, sorry, not to December, they were postponed uh, to, to October. And then there was, because of the damage and the loss of lives, 300,000 to 500,000 people were killed in East Pakistan. Um, it was requested that uh, there should be a further postponement and, and General Yaya did not agree. Um, Cyclone Bhola hit uh, East Pakistan after the floods in the summer. And uh, Many people were killed, lives were lost, uh, the economy was destroyed. Uh, President Yahya was late in going there. He had to make two trips to make up for the fact that he was late in going there. Uh, and that further alienated the people of East Pakistan and allowed the Awami League to talk about greater autonomy and a new constitutional uh, compact uh, that would allow them to order their own affairs. And the six points which they had been presenting, which incidentally are quite uh, prominently reflected in the 18th Amendment of the current Pakistan constitution, uh, greater autonomy for the provinces. Um, the six points suddenly came to the fore and people in his party then began saying, why do we want autonomy? Why don't we want freedom? And so when the time came for the uh, Pakistan Day celebrations, in March, uh, that's when uh, some of these uh, demands for independence arose inside East Pakistan. Uh, now, I, I've covered the history of this uh, in Cross Swords uh, quite uh, in depth. I went into the documents, I talked to the people, and uh, it's quite clear that the military, which is always prepared for civil unrest, uh, if it is called to come out in aid of civil power, has plans, and in fact, the very first plan for controlling uh, civil unrest in East Pakistan was authored by none other than uh, the brilliant strategician, um, military man, and later politician, um, Sajada Yaqub Khan, who wrote the plan. Uh, and, and he was quite confident that he could control the province with the, the few troops that they had uh, in East Pakistan. Uh, but then he changed his mind that uh, there was no military solution. And he tried to persuade his bosses, uh, particularly Yahya Khan, that uh, there should be political uh, solutions, there should be talks with the Iwami League, and some kind of solution should be found to the, to the discontent. Um, but he was uh, deemed to be a coward. Uh, in fact, uh, people uh, took a very dim view of his approach. Uh, and uh, he was threatened with a court martial. He was brought back from East Pakistan, reduced his rank in rank to major general, because they say technically he hadn't yet served long enough in his substantive rank of lieutenant general, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, I'm glad that history uh, set that right, and he eventually got his uh, three stars back uh, and did much greater things later on as a civilian. But uh, that, is, that, that is sort of one of the contributing factors. And so General Tikha Khan uh, was sent to East Pakistan, and then he was followed by General Niazi. Uh, now, when the troubles arose, and uh, I think it's well worth reminding, I, I'd like to quote from General Niazi, uh, if you allow me. Uh, because uh, he doesn't take any blame on himself. And, uh, and that is incorrect, and history is, has judged him. But he says that General Tikka, instead of carrying out the task given to him, that is to disarm the Bengali units and persons and to take into custody the Bengali leaders, resorted His orders to his troops were, quote, I want the land and not the people. Unquote. Major General Rao Farman Ali had written in his stable diary, quote, Greenland of East Pakistan will be painted red, unquote. 
Uh, this is what General Niazi recalls. Uh, of course, he was trying to clear his name. Uh, but essentially, uh, as a military historian, I, I see the military being occupied in two wars. There was one uh, war which was to be fought against India at the borders to prevent the ingress of Indian troops in support of the Mukti Bahini, whom they'd been training, something like 200,000 of them, uh, and equipping and assisting with uh, selected troops to go into East Pakistan and cause uh, trouble for the Pakistan military. And the other one was the internal uh, situation where you had essentially a foreign force uh, that uh, had been sent uh, without weapons because the Sri Lankan authorities wouldn't allow them to go via uh, their airport uh, in Colombo uh, if they were carrying weapons. And then weapons were provided to them once they got there. Uh, they were ill-equipped. There was almost no air force. The Navy was very limited. Uh, and, and not that the Navy was going to play a role. And they were surrounded by an overwhelming uh, number of Indian forces because India had, was actually not ready for military action uh, when trouble began in East Pakistan in March and April. And uh, uh, General uh, Manikshaw actually asked for time to prepare. Uh, it was only after the monsoons, he said, that he could actually try and uh, invade East Pakistan because before that, the land is flooded and there's no movement and you're confined to roads and you can be stopped very easily as we've seen the Russians uh, confronting uh, the Ukrainians uh, where they resorted to, to roads. So that was kind of the background. Again, on, looking on this, back, if, if I may quickly interrupt, yeah. a couple of things that I wanted to touch upon on this as well, like, you know, growing up and even now when you have armchair discussions with folks about what happened in Bangladesh, one hears a couple of things that are often repeated. One, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto said, Idar to mudar hum. You hear us there. Um, would love your thoughts on, did he actually say that and what's the context of that statement? The second thing one hears, obviously, is that America betrayed Pakistan by not supporting the Pakistan army in, in 1971 in East Pakistan. Would love uh, your response to that as well. And the third thing one I hear, at least, uh, or when I go through the documents uh, and some of the books, one sees is that, you know, there was this inherent racism or bigotry in the armed forces. You see this in the logic Bhutto spent for a Khan in 65, that a Muslim soldier is worth four or five Hindu Indian soldiers. Um, you heard that, you know, I heard that from my grandfather and my father who had some businesses in East Pakistan at the time that Bengalis were seen as racially inferior, could not fight. They were small, dark men who could be killed easily. Um, so on these three issues, um, you know, these are still keep coming up in my conversations, at least, and I'm sure in the audience's armchair conversation as well. So did Bhutto say, Idhar to Mudarham? Did America sort of, you know, betray Pakistan? And what was the role of racism in all of this? I think Mr. Bhutto may have thought this. Uh, he may have conveyed this sense, but uh, I, I don't see any solid source of where he actually said this. Uh, it is most probably a result of uh, an Urdu newspaper editor uh, trying to convey his thoughts by using this headline. Um, uh, the same applies to his threat about breaking the legs of people if they went to attend the National Assembly session in East Pakistan. Uh, I I may be wrong on this, but I have not seen a, a direct quotation or a source for that. Uh, but that's besides the point. He didn't want there uh, to be a, a National Assembly meeting in which the majority uh, was in the hands of, of Sheikh Mujib. Uh, uh, because he feared that Sheikh Mujib was going to take control and maybe alter the constitution of Pakistan. And that was a fear that he shared and he conveyed to uh, some of the generals that had surrounded General Yaya and were controlling his thought processes, um, And because Bhutto made allies with some of them. And, uh, uh, and they, they had conveyed to Yaya that uh, the moment Sheikh Mujib comes into power, you will not be a strong president. You will be like Queen Elizabeth. 
and you will just be a figurehead. And that hurt his sense of manhood. Uh, and, and he felt that he was now threatened. Uh, and this was after he had actually told journalists, and uh, this is on, on record at Dhaka airport when he was leaving after one of his meetings with Sheikh Mujib, he pointed in his direction and said, there's the future prime minister of Pakistan. So Yahya was uh, uh, way out of his depth. Uh, and he was a military man. So uh, it was, if it was a political defeat, it was a political defeat at the hands of the military. But I also believe that as uh, a military historian, that it was a military defeat. Because when you go to war, you choose your time. And you choose the way you go to war. And you don't make, make excuses after the event that uh, so-and-so didn't help us and so-and-so didn't help us. You have to fight the war on, on, on your own. Um, when the trouble began, the Indians were not ready. And Pakistan knew it. And Pakistan's policy was to protect the border and not allow any Indian incursion, which meant protecting the main roads going into East Pakistan. Um, they didn't have the troops uh, to control all the country uh, because uh, they didn't have the numbers on their side and they didn't have air cover. Indians had air support. Uh, Indians had Navy that could blockade uh, Chittagong. So um, there was a disadvantage, but the advantage is always with the defense because the offensive troops have to have a much larger majority. So four to one is sort of the traditional number that people Which use. again, we've seen in Ukraine recently as well. Yes, exactly. Where, uh, in fact, the Russians didn't have that those numbers and they, they lost badly as a result of that. So uh, between March and December 3rd, when the full-scale war began, let me just give you a very quick uh, analysis. Uh, Pakistan uh, had the opportunity, if it wanted to follow the policy that Yahya apparently decided to follow in December 3rd, which was to expand the war in such a way that it would bring in international intervention. This was, a, in hindsight, quite clearly the wrong calculation. Neither China nor America was going to enter the war. Let's park this thought for a minute. Yes. I, I just stream of consciousness. It's a it it keeps recurring in Pakistan history because we had similar logic in Kargil um, as well that we will internationalize the issue and somehow the international community will force India to act a certain way. But it's interesting that it goes that far back as well. Yes, and uh, this has been a traditional thought processes process in GHQ. Um, when they are in political power, that they think uh, they can control the, the way the world will act and react. And unfortunately, the world doesn't think along those lines. Uh, and we have suffered uh, historically as a result. So at that point, um, there were opportunities. If they wanted to internationalize the conflict, um, th they could have done that much earlier. In fact, in September, uh, when they moved the troops from Peshawar, the Seven Dev, and other divisions um, to their operational areas along the India-Pakistan border in West Pakistan, uh, they had the advantage. If they wanted to, they could have made a move on East, Pan uh, East Punjab uh, and uh, tried to create a crisis that the world would take note of. Uh, but they didn't. Uh, and it was uh, only on November 23rd that the Indians had all the wherewithal to launch their operations. And so they launched their full-scale operations on November 23rd, and they, they were attacking uh, the borders. Uh, but they had a strategy, which was that they would try and bypass the Pakistani military positions that were at the border uh, and go into the hinterland. Uh, interestingly, uh, they didn't appear to have a strategy to capture Dhaka. That was something that was thought at the local level, not at their strategic higher command level. And it was the locals that eventually came up with the idea of dropping some paratroops at Tangail and heading towards Dhaka. And uh, there are first-person accounts from the regiments that were involved in that, including... General uh, Satish Nambiar, who, who was a 
a major at that time. And I think he may have been the second in command of, of what's known as the Jangi Paltan. Uh, that when they arrived in Tangail, they didn't have any, any roadmaps on how to get to Dhaka. And so they bought uh, or picked up from a local bookshop some roadmaps and used them in order to go towards the, hitchhi the hitchhiker's guide yeah. to Dhaka. Exactly. Yes. And so uh, that's the way it, it happened. Um, if Pakistan wanted to, it could have done things much earlier to internationalize the conflict. And India was then at a military disadvantage and not fully prepared, uh, but they didn't. And then, and this is the part I, I've covered in Cross Swords also, uh, on December the 3rd, Pakistan launched air attacks on Indian airfields with uh, less than 36 aircraft uh, because they were saving, according to the then air chief, uh, Air Marshal Rahim, they were saving their, their planes and they didn't want to get the Indians to attack Sargodha and destroy their, their air base and other air bases. Uh, now, I compare that with um, what the Israelis did in 19. 67 in, in the in the June war when they attacked they had a, a little over 200 aircraft in their inventory and uh, according to um, the book on wings of eagle by the former air chief only one aircraft was left circling over tel aviv the entire inventory was launched in waves across into the mediterranean curving back from the west to attack the Egyptian airfields, and they destroyed almost the entire uh, Egyptian air force on the ground. Uh, so that's the kind of daring that was needed, which was missing in the, the air attack on December the 3rd, when we said that India had attacked Pakistan, but it was in fact the opposite. Pakistan was broadening the war. Now, uh, you talk of the Americans and the Chinese. The Americans had uh, the president and, and Mr. Kissinger felt indebted to Yahya, and they did their best to support him against opposition from within their own party, within their own government, from their Department of State, from their people on the ground in uh, Dhaka. Uh, the blood telegram uh, uh, is, is a good indication of what kind of report emerged. I've also read the National Intelligence Estimate of that time, and they used the word Bangladesh in that, because for them, it was now going to be a reality. There was no going back. Uh, so uh, that there was a split within the, the establishment in Washington. And uh, to his credit, uh, in terms of his relationship with the IR, Nixon and Kissinger both maintained that relationship till the end. And in fact, when they heard that the Indian cabinet was deciding to shift forces and to attack West Pakistan in order to break it up and destroy the Pakistan army forever, then uh, they sent word that that was forbidden. And I would add here that while Kissinger and uh, Nixon in debt were indebted, as you said, or liked Yahya yeah, and an affinity for him, they had a disdain, and perhaps that's a soft word or a diplomatic word for Indira Gandhi at the same yes. time as well. So and it that, wasn't that Indira was a friend of theirs at, at, as well. Yes. Uh, and the, the, the tapes um, in the Nixon White House are, are evidence of all that exchange. And then the tapes also tell us that Kissinger walked in uh, when uh, the attack on West Pakistan was cancelled uh, by the Indians uh, and said, um, Mr. President, you saved Pakistan. How did the, how did the Americans know um, that this was what the cabinet was considering. How were they able to... They, they had a mole. This? They yeah. had a mole in the Indian cabinet. Uh, and uh, I've seen some of the, uh, the the classified documentation when I was researching cross swords about those reports. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, of course, a lot of the, uh, the tape documentation was not widely available. Interesting. And then finally, on, on the, the, the racism or bigotry point, you obviously lived through that era, you covered that era um, as a journalist, and then for Crosswords, how much of an issue was that? Again, for me, as again, an amateur student of history, when I read some of these archives from these wars, even up to Cargill, Nassim Zara's book, Cargill to the Coup, has similar sort of, you know, she cites in softer words, a similar sort of thing that Muslim soldiers are better or the North 
uh, the Punjabi and Pashtun regiments are far superior to the Hindus. Uh, you saw this in six. I saw this in '65 as well. Did that play a role in decision making in '71 as well, in terms of the way in which the strategy and the tactics played out militarily? It could have played a role. Uh, I think uh, the basic problem was that when people were posted to East Pakistan, they didn't know the language, they didn't know the culture. Uh, the only commander of Eastern Command who actually made an effort was Sabzada Yaqub, who actually learned to speak Bangla. And he could probably read and write it too. Um, none of the others had any of the language skills, and it, neither did they attempt to do that. And I pointed this out uh, in my more recent writings on, on our operations in Fatah, that when we moved troops into Fatah, instead of selecting those regiments of the Pakistan army, that were at least 50% Pakhtun. Uh, we, we selected the ones that were in close proximity to Fata, uh, whose operational area was the LOC uh, and the, the border with India, who didn't know Fata. And uh, we sent in people who didn't know the language. Uh, for them, it was a completely foreign territory. The same thing happened in Balochistan. Uh, I mean, I, when I was traveling in, in, in North Waziristan, I recall being accompanied by an officer and I asked him how long he'd been there. He said he was there for two years. And I said, you must speak Pashto. And he said, no. So uh, there's, there was this cultural chasm that existed. Uh, the Bengali elite spoke Urdu and they sent their kids to Aitchison uh, and they sent, uh, you know, they, you know, they were investing with partners from the West in industries in East Pakistan, as well as in West Pakistan. Uh, but the ordinary people were kept at a distance. And um, when our troops landed there, they were told essentially that these people are really not as good Muslims as we are, uh, because there's a very large Hindu population and their culture and their mores are much more aligned to uh, India and to the Hindus than they are to, to us as, as the pure Muslims. Uh, the martial races uh, issue uh, has been discussed in terms of the British Empire in India. Also, it, it was uh, a construct of the British in order to be able to isolate and have controlled access to recruitment and catchment areas where certain tribes were deemed to be martial and others were not. But history uh, actually points in the other direction. If you look, look at the or original recruitment of the East India Army, it was uh, the, the Madras regiments and the Bengal regiments. Uh, and they, those were not being uh, populated by people from uh, Punjab or the Northwest frontier. It was only later that that happened. Um, the Bombay presidency, you know, it, it sort of went from Bengal to the, the the south and then up the Bombay presidency and then eventually uh, only after the invasion of uh, uh, of the Punjab did uh, the Punjab become a catchment area for recruitment and the so-called sword arm of the British Empire. So there was a lot of misinformation, uh, misunderstanding, lack of knowledge. Uh, but uh, remember, there were also East Bengal regiments which had... Uh, a mix of officers, um, and uh, some of the early rebellions were against the West Pakistani officers by the uh, other officers and soldiers of the East Bengal Regiment. They formed the core group of the Mukti Bahini. Um, at a personal level, I know, because the East Bengal Regiment in Chittagong was commanded by my cousin, and he, according to his wife, he was allegedly killed by the second in command, uh, Major Zia Rahman, who later became president of Bangladesh. Uh, now, his wife makes this allegation. Uh, there's no proof because there were no witnesses. But uh, he was asked to go back to the office uh, and uh, told that Major Zia had sent the message. And when he arrived there, he was shot. And so that's what happened. Uh, and it happened in other places. So when the army arrived in East Pakistan, uh, they had an impetus to uh, somehow, they felt, uh, 
right the wrongs that had been done. Uh, and so this is the second battle that was going on internally. They were trying to catch people and uh, mete out justice uh, in their view. Uh, and, and so a lot of innocent people got killed. There were rapes that were documented. The numbers of people killed uh, has been debated widely, and I want to revisit that very briefly. Uh, there's only one time that three million was used, and that was in a story in Pravda. And then when Sheikh Mujib uh, was released and went to London, he held a press conference where he used uh, a lower figure. And uh, someone whispered in his ear that it was three million, and then he repeated three million, and then it got currency. So um, I, I don't think there's any proof of three million people but it doesn't matter uh, whether it's it's three people or 30 or 300,000 or 3 million. Uh, it was killings uh, on a large scale uh, and a lot of innocent Biharis uh, uh, and other people that supported the military operation uh, were killed by the Mukti Bahini also. And I think the, the legacy of that continues, right? Only a few years ago, there were hangings in, in Bangladesh um, of the Jamaat leadership uh, in relation to 1971 as well. Um, so I think Chaudhary Nisar made a big deal out of it in Islamabad as when he was interior minister, it led to a diplomatic spat of sorts. Um, but, you know, as you said, the, the exact number may be whatever, but the fact of the matter is, and you read the quote as well, that, you know, the idea was to paint the land red. Um, and obviously, these were Pakistanis uh, that the army was going after. And, and the loss of one innocent Pakistani life is still a crime, uh, nonetheless. Um, <clears throat> moving on from, from this day, right? Obviously, the surrender happens. Um, there is chaos within what is left of Pakistan, West Pakistan. Um, Yahya is deeply unpopular. I've read that he was confronted by the soldiers as well. What was the mood like um, in Pakistan after that, when, when things sort of everybody knew that the surrender had happened? And, you know, I, I remember uh, the famous Dawn headline as well, right? Like, I think it was a day before or on the day of the surrender, like fight to the end or something like that. But clearly that was propaganda. Um, what was it like when finally everybody woke up and realized that East Pakistan was gone? Bangladesh had been born. Um, and and the new reality was that Pakistan, West Pakistan, was now Pakistan. I think there was a sense of surprise and disappointment both. Um, Yaya was immediately uh, the object of uh, of disdain uh, within the military as well as uh, in the general public, and so uh, the military, uh, under the influence of uh, Brigadier F. B. Ali and some of his uh, colleagues essentially sent a message to uh, General Gul Hassan, um, who was at army headquarters, uh, to uh, to talk to uh, Air Marshal Rahim and to convince Yaya to step down. Otherwise, uh, there was a threat that uh, an armored column would move uh, from Karia towards Rawalpindi. Um, th there was also a discussion within uh, the presidency in, in, in Rawalpindi of trying to use some uh, SSG troops to protect the president, but uh, that uh, thankfully didn't take place because that was the last thing Pakistan needed was uh, an internal push and a military rebellion. So uh, Yahya was backed off uh, and an immediate message was sent to Mr. Bhutto, who, if you remember uh, at that time, a lot of people forget this, had already accepted on December the 3rd the position of Deputy Prime Minister of Pakistan under Nurul Amin, who was the designated civilian Prime Minister of Pakistan. This was the kind of uh, wallpapering that uh, the Yahya government had done on the 3rd of December. And I remember that vividly, Uzair, because I was working for Pakistan Television News, and I was actually on the stage behind Mr. Bhutto at Liaquat Bagh when he made that speech, in which he explained to his people that I've decided that we should, I should take this position of deputy uh, prime minister, because, and now my message to, to Yaya is to step aside and let us run things. 
because we will find a solution. I, I am curious now, and I'll maybe after this dig up, uh, see, and I'll bug you on this as well, on the legal uh, wormholes that were jumped uh, to create this sort of a wallpapering effect. Um, obviously, we've been exchanging this offline as well. Similar legal wallpapering has happened with the Rico Dick case, uh, which is uh, has infuriated me, as you know. Uh, but that's for another day. But that, you know, obviously that legal wallpapering or the wormhole jumping continues to today. And I'm intrigued and curious now to see what the logic that was used uh, to create the legal structure that allowed all of this to happen on December 3rd as well. Well, the thinking, particularly in the military circles at that time, and maybe it persists, was that if, if we can do it, we'll do it. And we'll take care of the, the, the legal aspects later. Now, Nurul Amin had no seats in parliament. Amazing. And there was uh, you know, no way that anyone in, in Bengal would recognize him as a political leader. But he was a Bengali, and he was willing to, to play the role. And so um, it was suggested. And then there was that other bizarre story, which I covered in detail in Cross Swords, when I was called uh, on, the seven, on the 17th, the day after the surrender, to introduce President Yahya Khan, and I was given his speech. And then I was told at first, well, he's unable to speak, so you're going to have to speak for him. So I was practicing speaking with his voice, you know, you know, and saying, I have decided this, to come up with the new constitutional plan. And and thankfully, uh, Siraj Saab, the assistant editor of News, rushed in and said, okay, cancel Hogi. No, no more speech. So Otherwise, you're going to be you're going to be a yeah. double for Yahya Khan. Yeah, uh, and so it didn't take place. But I still have that speech somewhere in my archives, um, and uh, uh, some of it was distributed to foreign press too. Some of whom refused to return their copies. Uh, it was too little, and it was too late. Uh, if a constitutional arrangement had to be crafted, it should have been done after the elections. Uh, if they if they wanted to have some kind of reservations uh, addressed uh, about what would happen and, and what was the future of Pakistan. At the very least, and I think this is something that was completely missing in the calculus uh, in, in the military cabal that ran the country, uh, they could have prevented a war. They could have prevented a loss of life. And Bangladesh may have emerged over time but there could well have been some kind of a confederal arrangement or an alliance of some sort uh, between the two parts of the country uh, and the sharing of assets which would uh, be equitable. Uh, but none of that was done. Yeah, and I think, I mean, uh, just from my own, um, you know, I came to the United States in 2007 and, and sort of was always intrigued by history. So I ended up in my university's um, uh, library to find out historical texts that perhaps I did not have access to growing up in Pakistan. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, two friends of mine, they were both Bangladeshi, saw me with the blood telegram. And they were like, well, why are you reading this? And I was like, well, I just wanted to understand and was curious about what happened. Um, and we would talk about this, right? And and the cultural affinity, the friendship, the, 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 the ability of Bangladeshis and Pakistanis to engage and interact with each other remain after all these years and after the brutality of 1971. But as I read that book, it came as a shocker to me that nobody had bothered teaching us about what exactly had happened. Because again, if you don't learn from history, you're supposed to repeat it over and over again, which I wanted to ask you about as well, is looking back at this, um, where we are today, what our friend Musharraf Zaidi calls the poly crisis or the perma crisis in Pakistan. The last year or so has been an absolute disaster um, in that term. Balochistan is up in arms. Fata is back. Uh, you know, the TTP is back in, in those regions, the former Fata regions, hot firing uh, of artillery on the border on the western frontier. Um, do you think we've learned anything from 1971 and what caused it, what were the repercussions of that? Or is it just that the reading of history and the teaching of history, more importantly, so flawed um, that we just keep repeating the mistakes of the past, hoping for a new, better outcome, even though it's not possible? Well, our history books keep getting changed. And with successive changes in government, the texts change and uh, bits and pieces are expunged. 
uh, I'm told, um, and I, I, there's no way I can confirm it because all my efforts at reaching my former employer, Pakistan Television, have completely failed in asking for access to archives or photographs or films uh, from that period. Because I was told at one time that uh, many of the archives had been purged. Uh, so when Mr. Bhutto was removed from power, that they removed a lot of uh, material dealing with him. And I'm sure that uh, with the successive changes of government, uh, the uh, kind of uh, musical chairs that we had in the 90s, uh, there must have been successive purges of material at that time too. Uh, in terms of the actual history that is taught, in the schools, uh, that that has its own tinge, and there are vast gaps in it. Uh, there is almost no relationship to the local population, or to India as a whole, uh, with uh, with with uh, Muslims uh, playing a role in India even today, in independent India. Uh, there's almost no reference to that. In terms of the relationship between what was East Pakistan and is now Bangladesh and, and what uh, was West Pakistan is, is now the rump of Pakistan. Um, we have not yet reached a stage where our leaders uh, will allow a, a reckoning and uh, at least an acceptance of responsibility for what happened. Uh, and uh, there, there have been visits by the heads of government. So Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif went there um, my brother, when he was the army chief, was in touch with his course mate, who was the army chief in Bangladesh, uh, and they had a very good relationship. But uh, nothing come, came of this. Uh, there was no attempt made at saying, okay, uh, we recognize that uh, wrongs were committed. We are very sorry about it. We take responsibility. How can we move forward and work together? Uh, there, there are attempts still being made uh, to use intelligence assets in East Pakistan using the Islamic networks uh, as a base. Uh, and, and these have attracted the attention, not just of Bangladeshis, but of Western intelligence also. Uh, and, and that should be a concern for Pakistan. So all of these things need to be addressed. But uh, first of all, the people need to ask questions and learn to read. And if, if, if there are books that are available to go and find them and read them. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And I think um, one uh, person I interviewed for my own research on the war in uh, Afghanistan and the counterinsurgency campaigns was a retired uh, brigadier or major. He told me that as he began reading books that he wasn't reading when he was in service, uh, the green tint on his glasses began to clear out and he saw a much clearer picture of the world and what had happened. And that allowed him to sort of, you know, reconsider his own beliefs and, and anchor points as well. Um, this conversation, Shira Saab, obviously cannot be complete by it without talking about the current crisis. I have been saying for months now that at least to me, um, as a 35 year old, this crisis looks uh, perhaps the most serious crisis to cohesion since 71 in terms of the political crisis, the polarization, uh, the growth of the military's influence overt and covert on the political economy. And then of course the floods came, um, the catastrophic floods earlier this year. How do you see this current crisis in the backdrop of 71? Um, and, and what is going on today in terms of, you know, trying to somehow keep the status quo intact with a populist politician who's perhaps the most popular leader in Pakistan right now, agitating for elections, creative ways being found to somehow try and disqualify him, which I don't think will work, but that keeps coming up in terms of the leaks and cases, etc. Um, what is your thought on where Pakistan is today and, and what is needed to get out of this crisis at this point in time? I think you're right. In many ways, um, the basic dynamics that led to the breakup of Pakistan in 1971 have not changed. Uh, and one way of describing it is to show the manner in which the center deals with the periphery. At that time, East Pakistan was a very distant periphery. 
But after the loss of East Pakistan and the birth of Bangladesh, within West Pakistan, the imbalance in the political structure and the administrative structure uh, in, in terms of the size of the provinces led to the same uh, dynamic being repeated. So Balochistan and uh, the Northwest Frontier Province, and particularly the border regions, Fata got short shrift. And we are paying the price for that. There's no amount of military action uh, that can provide you the security that economic integration and equality of opportunity can, uh, where there's voice, where you're not differentiating populations based on sects uh, or which part of which sect are you, uh, but uh, everyone is treated as a Pakistani. Now, the good thing is that in spite of all these efforts on the part of the elites, and uh, I know some of my Fauji friends don't like the use of the word elite capture, but there's a science behind that. And it, it, it is now an accepted term in social science to, to describe the kind of uh, um, loot and pillage that occurs by people that have uh, preferred access to resources and that have created what I call uh, the culture of entitlement in Pakistan. And to quickly well, interrupt you, uh, yeah. if I can, um, you know, there's also this this perception when you when what you said when I say that people respond saying, "Well, it's legal. Well, capture can be legal. It doesn't have to be illegal for it to be loot and corruption and extraction." I think it's important for people to understand that that. East India Company was extracting and pillaging resources out of the subcontinent legally. There was nothing illegal about it. Um, so it's. I just wanted to point that out as well for people who get confused about the legality of these things. Yes, that's why I call, I call it the culture of entitlement because when you create legal entitlements and you define them in a way that benefits you as opposed to other elements of your society, then that's what elite capture becomes. And it is institutionalized in both the civil and the military. I mean, you and I have been exchanging uh, messages about the fact that even journalists have now been allotted land at preferred rates in colonies by the government, which in any other society would be considered an outright bribe. Uh, and, and any self-respecting journalist would not want his or her name associated with the receipt of that land, but uh, that's not going to be the case because it's done. Uh, we had a recent report from a former foreign secretary, uh, Mr. Shamshad Ahmed, uh, who said that he was told that he, he was uh, eligible to receive a plot of land in Islamabad, which would be worth crores today. Uh, but he was supposed to sign a piece of paper, an affidavit, saying he didn't have a home. And everyone else in his category, at his level, had signed the piece of paper because, it, quote unquote, it's just a piece of paper. So that's the entitlement that, that we're talking about. But going back to your main question, which is, you know, how far does this resemble uh, what was happening at that time? Uh, it, it may not be as dire because distance is not there, the large populations are not there, uh, but the potential for um, disruption in society and the potential for an inability to meet unexpected issues that are beyond national control, whether it's natural disasters or whether it's the war in Ukraine or whether it's the price of energy on the global markets, all of these things need to be taken into account. The leadership in Pakistan, civil and military, needs to focus on creating a strong economy, which is inclusive and accountable and where actions take place transparently. And everyone is held accountable. Parliament has 50% of its uh, members don't pay any taxes. Pakistan postponed agricultural land reform that India instituted at the time of independence. To this day, agricultural income is not subject to income tax. And that's where the politicians and the feudals continue to benefit. 
at the expense of the ordinary people in the countryside? Uh, why is the rural sin continuing to be one of the poorest populations in the country uh, because of the feudal system, which has remained um, endemic to that part of, of the country? Uh, interestingly, if you look at uh, worker migration to the Gulf, um, I was told that Sindh has the lowest migration because feudal landlords will not allow anyone to go uh, because they have control over their families and their lands. And so you've had um, worker migrations taking place from Pata and from the Northwest Frontier Province, erstwhile Northwest Frontier Province, uh, and the Punjab, uh, and, and even Balochistan, which traditionally always had people going overseas um, for military and uh, economic purposes. But Sindh uh, has lost out on that. So the transfer of wealth that occurred in the Punjab, particularly in rural Punjab, has not occurred in Sindh. Yeah, and I think on the Sindh side, the PBS has the household income survey data, which I was looking up a few months ago, and it has actually a line item there in terms of household contribution, uh, income contribution from foreign remittances. And KP um, is roughly 10 to 12 percent on average, um, whereas Sindh is, I think, under 2 percent. Um, so yes. th it is a stark differential. You're absolutely right on that. Um, sure and, and they have proximity. They have proximity. Oh, they're right next. They have right next to the Gulf. So yeah. Um, well, inclusive politics. I think uh, again, I couldn't agree more with that. In fact, this whole uh, I would say an elite wet dream of separating the economy from politics. Uh, and that talk has been happening for the last year in the guise of a charter for economy. I think is absolutely dangerous. I think very few people recognize how dangerous this would be because as you described earlier right like east pakistan was extracted extracted its resources were extracted as a colony um why because it didn't have a say in the politics of the country and eventually they rose up and bangladesh was born and i think again for those of you from the audience tuning in i think it's important to understand that economic policy making is fundamentally a political choice and if you don't include people especially in a diverse country like Pakistan, in that choice, um, eventually they will rise up and resist and find ways uh, to get their own way forward. Perhaps people uh, would look at Bangladesh and its its birth uh, a bit more analytically to understand what the dangers here are. But again, Shuja Saab, thank you so much for your time. Uh, before I let you go, maybe I'm putting you on the spot on this one, but I always ask my guests uh, for reading recommendations. So would love a couple of books that you think people should pick up and read in addition to the two fantastic books you've written, Crosswords and The Battle for Pakistan. Can be on any topic, but would love your thoughts on that. Well, I, I would like to recommend to my friends in the military a book called The Transformation of War, um, which um, should be read. Um, and then uh, on Afghanistan, and particularly the mess that uh, was created in the country, there's a book called War from the Ground Up. Um, th these are the two titles uh, that might be useful for some of my military friends. Um, I'm uh, These days, uh, as you know, I, I donated my personal library, so I'm trying to rebuild parts of it now. And I'm trying to, uh, very uh, intrigued by many of the, the new novels that have emerged from uh, Pakistani uh, authors, uh, and particularly those in the diaspora. So I've now got a pile of five or six books that uh, either have been gifted to me or that I've purchased. And as soon as I've read them, I will make my recommendations again. We're looking forward to those reviews as well. I think uh, diaspora fiction or just uh, fiction, my own favorite is historical fiction because it gets you both, uh, at least from my point of view, both of the drugs that I love, which is history and a bit of drama and historical fiction mixes the two quite well. Um, so again, thank you for your time. Always a pleasure having you and, and we'll host you soon enough on the podcast as well. I'm sure of it. But in the meantime, take care and for the office. Thank you. Good office.